Welcome to the uh, list planning subcommittee meeting. Uh, I am the chair, I'm councillor Barbara Blake. Um, if I can get members to introduce themselves, please, starting on my left. Where's your right sponsor for Tottenham Hill Ward? Scott Emery, Councillor of Highgate Ward. Sue Jameson, Bruce Castle. Councillor Sean O'Donovan from uh, Tottenham Hill. Lossie Collett, Woodside. John Bevan, Northumberland Park. Thank you. If the officers present can introduce themselves, please, starting on my left. Cody Sprott, Principal Committee Coordinator. Matthew Barrett, Legal Services. Rob Shasovsky, Assistant Director for Planning, Building Standards and Sustainability. Robin McNocker, Head of Development Management and Planning Enforcement. Philip Elliott, Principal Planning Officer. John Mike Rory, Major Applications Team Leader. Richard Truscott, Design Officer. Uh, Gareth Prosser, Deputy Team Leader for the East. Thank you very much. And um, other officers that are here or that are in attendance virtually will introduce themselves when relevant. So we're now on to item one, which is filming at meetings. This meeting is being recorded. All registered speakers should be aware that they will be recorded for live or subsequent broadcast via the Council's internet site or by anyone attending the meeting. Item two is the planning protocol. Uh, members and speakers are requested to note the information set out at item two on the agenda. So that's in the pack, please note that. Um, item three is apologies. We have apologies. Uh, apologies have been received from Councillor Worrell, Councillor Ibrahim and Councillor Brennan. Uh, Councillor O'Donovan will be Councillor Brennan's substitute. Um, this is in accordance with committee standing orders fifth, uh, uh, 53 to 56. Oh, and we do have apologies from Councillor Dunstall as well. So we're on to item four, uh, which is urgent business. And I have there are no items of urgent business. Item five, any declarations of interest, please? No, OK. Item six uh, are the minutes. Uh, can, can the committee approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 5th of February? Do we approve those? Yeah, OK. So we're now on to uh, planning applications. Um, and this is um, seven, thir three, thir 341 A Seven Sisters Road. In the agenda packets, pages seven to 328. Um, I won't read out the proposal. I will hand over to uh, the planning officer to introduce this application. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I'll just load the presentation. So this is an application for the construction of two new buildings and to provide warehouse living accommodation above ancillary and commercial floor space at ground level. The proposal also includes the installation of 10 shipping containers, some over two storeys to provide um, workspace and artist studios, as well as associated facilities and storage. Um, landscaping and public realm works are also proposed, which include the widening and rerouting of an existing alleyway linking Seven Sisters and Tewksbury Roads. There are also works to the western end of Tewksbury Road. Uh, the proposal also includes the creation of rain gardens, greening, seating, signage and artworks and other associated infrastructure works, including the removal of an existing substation and the provision of a new one. Uh, so the site is located um, on the corner of Seven Sisters and Eve Roads near to the borough boundary with Hackney to the south. The new river runs westwards uh, to the south of Ede Road towards Finsbury Park. Um, the Woodbury Down Estate, which is under redevelopment, is located to the south of Seven Sisters Road. Uh, to the north and northeast of the site is what is known as the Haringey Warehouse District. 
um, which is a collection of buildings that are commercial in nature that contain both businesses and warehouse living. Uh, further to the north is the Overground Railway Line uh, with St Anne's Hospital uh, beyond and further to the northeast is Green Lanes and the Haringey Ladder. Uh, traditionally, the district was host to manufacturing in the form of the Maynard Sweet Factory, as well as other factories producing furniture, uh, pianos and electrical goods. Um, as these businesses moved out, a uh, small scale garment manufacturing uh, moved in. But again, as these businesses moved away, many big uh, buildings became um, vacant by the mid to late 90s. Uh, at this point, artists started to move in and the numbers of people living and working in some of the buildings grew. Uh, enforcement action was initially pursued uh, by the council due to the low quality of some of the units um, and fire safety issues. Um, but the council has since worked with landlords to improve fire safety and bring properties uh, in line with HMO standards. Uh, subsequently, the warehouse living policy in the development management DPD uh, was adopted. A warehouse living accommodation can be described as a shared as having shared internal communal space, um, which is used for cooking and socialising, but is also used as a workspace. It's um, flexible within physical spaces that allow both living and working within communal areas, uh, depending on the needs of residents. Residents often choose to live in the district because of the opportunities um, that the warehouses provide to pursue creative and collaborative activities. Um, the spaces the warehouses support are sufficiently flexible such that they can absorb the uh, demands placed upon them by the residents. And generally the district's uh, success is based on the collaborative and entrepreneurial nature of the people who live there, uh, which is um, which has tied the community together and organically uh, developed its character. So across the district, uh, there are four separate site allocations uh, where uh, that are defined as sort of warehouse living sites. These include um, SA34, which is over Brienne Roads, which the site falls within. Uh, the site allocation itself identifies the potential of increasing accessibility through and across the site uh, and providing mixed use floor space, including warehouse living accommodation. Uh, part of the site also falls within uh, site allocation SA35, which supports the redevelopment of, um, of existing buildings to create higher quality uh, streetscape on Tewksbury Road. Uh, and also complement the, the wider Haringey Warehouse neighbourhood. Uh, the site allocations within the district or within um, local employment area regeneration areas. Uh, this is where development management DVD policy DM38 applies. Uh, the centre of the district that also um, that contains the locally listed former Maynard Sweet Factory uh, um, is, is a locally significant industrial site. Uh, which also includes Valentria Clothing Village, which has uh, had permission for more employment space recently. So the site um, sits within SA34, um, which is that the so the site's in the southeastern corner of that site location. Uh, it generally surrounds the building Cara House, uh, which contains uh, 70 rooms of warehouse living accommodation. Uh, across the site allocation itself, there are approximately um, 570 uh, rooms of warehouse living accommodation in amongst other commercial spaces. So the site itself, as it as it currently is, uh, is made up of a series of connected parcels, which uh, include the land to the front of Cara House, uh, the corner of Ede Road and Seven Sisters Road, which contains a street, a, a steep dot, a drop to the north. Uh, then there's the uh, footpath leading from Seven Sisters Road down to Tewksbury Road. Um, the lower ground floors of 341 and 343 Seven Sisters Road and two to four Tewkesbury Road and the end of the road itself. And then finally, uh, also the land to the rear of Car House uh, called Cotton Mill Yard. 
So development management DVD policy DM38 uh, relates to development in local employment area regeneration areas and requires um, uh, the following things, uh, employment floor space to be maximised. Um, it requires proposals to show how the site will continue to support employment uses. Um, it requires the provision of affordable workspace if this is viable. And it seeks to ensure appropriate immunity uh, for the accommodation and surrounding uh, residents. It also um, seeks to ensure the proposal does not conflict with existing employment uses. Uh, policy DM39 supports proposals for uh, warehouse living in these areas uh, where they form part of an agreed master plan to increase and diversify the employment offer whilst providing an appropriate standard living for the integrated residential element. So this submission is supported by a master plan framework in accordance with DM39. Uh, the framework identifies how the proposal would provide for the needs of residents uh, and fit in with future development uh, within other parts of the allocation and beyond. It has been uh, prepared with due regard to the circumstances of the site and also the matters uh, identified in the policy. So the, the proposals would include 30 new warehouse living units, um, which would be delivered on the upper floors of the two new buildings. Uh, block A would be a building of 10 storeys on the corner of Seven Sisters and Eat Road, and Block B would be a four storey building to the front of Car House. Uh, there would be a range of unit sizes with four bed units up to 14 bed units. And these reflect um, the sort of size and range of units that are found across the district already. Um, I should also say commercial floor space would be located across the ground floors of the new blocks uh, within the shipping containers and within the lower floors of 341 and 343 Seven Sisters Road. So there would be 101 warehouse living rooms, uh, of which uh, 21 would be double rooms and potentially have the capacity for double occupancy. And 10% of the rooms would be accessible. Uh, this would equate to over 4,000 square metres of warehouse living floor space and would include two dedicated workspace uh, units tethered to the accommodation in the below ground levels of Block A. Uh, these would be made available to residents in perpetuity. Uh, there would be also near to 500 square metres of commercial floor space. Um, the floor uh, layouts have been informed by the master plan, which considers requirements for room sizes uh, in the London plan for HMO accommodation and uh, other examples of warehouse living in the district. Uh, a key component of um, the, from the master plan is the need to extend the need for extended floor to ceiling heights, um, which improve quality, but also uh, provide the opportunity to integrate raised bed decks into rooms uh, to provide uh, more usable floor space. Uh, the room sizes reflect the minimum standards for room sizes in the London plan, uh, albeit the quality of the accommodation is improved by the bigger volumes and that potential to add in the bed decks. Um, across the units, there's a focus on the communal areas, with the, uh, particularly with the larger units um, containing double height communal spaces. Uh, the, the ground floors of the new blocks um, would have commercial spaces, which are shown here on the left in the light yellow. Uh, these would provide activation to Ede Road, um, whereas the rest of the ground floor would provide one unit to the rear of block A, uh, as well as associated storage, uh, refuse storage and cycle storage. So the building I said earlier was 10 storeys, but from Seven Sisters uh, Road, it appears as part seven, part eight. And then because of the sort of topography and the land level difference, there's two floors uh, below ground or below Seven Sisters Road. Um, so the parts of Block A below Seven Sisters Road would include the dedicated workspace for residents of the development, as well as um, plant, plant space. Uh, the shipping containers, um, and below ground floors of 341 and 343 Seven Sisters Road um, would be utilised to create a series of commercial spaces that would activate the route down to Tewksbury Road and 
this is called Tewkesbury Yard. So the development would include several uh, amenity spaces or open spaces and areas of public realm, and these include uh, Kari Yard, which is might be uh, on the plan here. Uh, this is between Car House and the four storey building block B. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a roof terrace to block A uh, for residents, which is marked here E. A uh, key part of the proposal is, is the um, steps footway from Seven Sisters Road through Tewkesbury Yard to Tewkesbury Road. And then there's also Cotton Mill Yard. Cotton Mill Yard to the rear of uh, Cara House. So these are some images of the existing footway from Seven Sisters Road to Tewkesbury Road. Um, it's a narrow passageway with uh, initially with steep steps uh, moving down as you move north through the site and um, with very little uh, passive surveillance or activation um, and can be quite unwelcoming, particularly at night time. So the proposal, um, the existing footway here is shown in the sort of brighter uh, mint green and then the lighter green kind of shows how the footway would be extended, um, it would be widened and uh, it, the steps would be made uh, more gradual and pedestrian safety would essentially be improved. And um, the works would also include improvements to the uh, western, uh, southwestern end of Cheeksby Road. Uh, the new route would be activated by the new uses um, along Cheeksbury Yard and would include planting, uh, seating and a pool ramp to bring uh, cycles along the route. Uh, the taller building, uh, Block A, would provide a gateway building marking the improved footway and the wider district uh, from Seven Sisters Road and the wider area, uh, which is a site requirement of the site allocation, SA34. Uh, block B is lower in height uh, to minimise impacts on Cara House. So these images just show uh, uh, 3D images looking north at the proposals uh, and then also uh, an image looking south towards it just to see it in context. And you can see sort of cheeks for yards with the containers and then that route up to Semesis Road. So the design, including the materials of the building, is supported by uh, both the GLA and the QRP. Um, the proposal would preserve nearby listed buildings and their setting and the character and appearance of nearby conservation areas. Uh, there has been some harm identified, identified from a particular view uh, from Vartry Road of Woodbury Down Baptist Church. Um, but the harm identified would be less than substantial and would be outweighed uh, by the benefits of the scheme. Uh, with the inclusion of the tethered workspaces in Block A for the use of residents, the scheme does not generate a surplus in terms of viability. Uh, this means that the scheme cannot support a contribution to affordable housing or further Section 106 contributions. Um, rents are expected to be in the region of £950 per month, and this is what the viability has been run on. Uh, warehouse living is tends to be by its nature affordable as it uh, provides workspace within uh, the living space, and the combination of the two cuts costs by avoiding the need for residents to have to rent both a home as well as a space to work. Um, a late stage review would secure a contribution to affordable housing if rents exceed those uh, set out in the viability report um, when any increase in costs is accounted for. Uh, the rents would be monitored as well over time, which would inform any future proposals for warehouse living. So the next few slides um, just show some images of the scheme. Uh, the first is a view looking north from Seven Sisters Road. And then secondly, we have um, a comparable view looking south from Seven Sisters Road. And you can just see the buildings of Woodbury Down in the distance, Woodbury Down Baptist Church, just on uh, its left there, uh, hiding behind the trees. Uh, the next few slides are CGI's, uh, so they're not renders quite like the, the last images. Um, 
this slide shows the scheme in a view looking north um, from Seven Sisters Road. Uh, it just shows those commercial units on the corner at the bottom of Block A and that route going down to Jukesbury Road. So this image shows uh, Block A from Seven Sisters Road. And you can see what I was saying about the height there is um, it's just those seven stories with the roof terrace uh, leading to eight behind. Um, so the full 10 stories don't appear from Seven Sisters Road. Uh, this is a view uh, looking west from Shootsbury Road. Uh, this is our house in the immediate uh, vicinity, and then we've got uh, the containers, the start of the containers and the start of that public realm, the route up to Seven Sisters Road. And yeah, this next image shows essentially Tutsby Yards. So we've got the containers um, on the left and right uh, leading up to that footway, new improved footway. And Block, uh, block A is just seen um, to the right hand side with those workspaces that are te tethered to the um, use of the building um, just above that couple of those shipping containers just on the right there. So these next two images just show uh, what it would be like in the sort of communal space in one of the larger uh, clusters or units. Uh, this would be the upper floor of um, of one of those spaces, and then subsequently the lower floor below, sort of leading out onto the terrace area balcony. Uh, just a final few bits on. Um, some other matters, energy and transport, um, the development would comply with um, sustainable infrastructure policies of the London plan, includes uh, several uh, sustainability measures that satisfies those policies. Um, the site is uh, high public transport, has a high public transport accessibility level um, and the surrounding streets are not over parked. Uh, the, Development itself would be car free, but would uh, deliver blue badge parking on street as well as a car club bay. And there would be uh, acceptable levels of car uh, cycle parking. So in terms of conditions and obligations, uh, the dedicated workspaces in Block A would be secured for residents um, in perpetuity. And details of their marketing and allocation would be controlled by management plan. Uh, conditions would also require a warehouse living management plan to be submitted to ensure the proposals comply with those relevant policies, the M38 and the M39. 10% uh, of the commercial floor space would also be secured um, at affordable rents. Uh, there will be viability review mechanisms, including uh, uh, including a late stage review, a construction phase skills and training con contributions, um, and conditions and obligations securing details of the new footway. Um, to secure ongoing maintenance and safe public access, but also a requirement to enter into the necessary sort of legal highway legal agreements to secure those highway and public realm works. Uh, that's the end. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, so, Councillor Bartlett, um, do you have any declarations of interest? No. OK. Um, as you've joined when we started this, item you won't be able to vote on it um or comment on it okay so right thank you okay any questions please right lots of questions so councillor o'donovan okay thank you um at the start of this application the it, it's, it's uh, described as sued generous which um, I might to check my Latin to find out that means of its own kind, nothing else like it. And I know that that category um, includes large houses of multiple occupancy. Um, is this, um, is, is the living areas, are they considered um, uh, HMOs? Um, I noticed uh, today we received um, from the private sector housing team, their comment was the units provided may need selected for HMO property licenses once let. Um, the question is, may they need them or do they actually do need HMO licenses? In terms of the room spaces, I think I may have missed it. I can see the double room um, is described as 42. Uh, 
well actually you may not even have that information what is the square footage of the single rooms and the double rooms thank you I think as to whether they need licensing is kind of a separate matter. I think as a planning use, it's its own use. So HMOs are their own use. Basically, sui genus just means a class of its own. So it's its own class and can only be de designed as such. So potentially it might need certain licensing down the line, but um, it, it, I think even the, the team that's made the comment isn't sure at this stage. Um, in terms of room sizes, the single bed space rooms would be 7.5 square metres and double rooms would be 11.5 square metres. 7.5 single and 11.5 or double with some with some larger. It does vary because of the sort of size and layout of the building. Um, uh, yeah, I think maybe we could get could we get clarification? about um, the designation of this in a sense. Uh, is there any certainty? It sounds so from what you're saying that there isn't a certainty as to whether or not this would be considered a, a property of multiple occupancy. And I understand HMO and it, 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 it's mentioned in here, HMOs, um, the minimum for single rooms is 10 square meters. The minimum for double rooms is 15 square meters. Um, the figures you gave me seem to be smaller than that. Yeah, I'll just talk about HMO rooms. So uh, the HMO rooms tend to be that size because that's the likely the only space that anyone would have to live in. So in a house, they might not have any communal space. So the 10 square meters guarantees them some space that isn't just the bedroom space, whereas these rooms have significant communal space, but they also have that raised floor to ceiling height, which enables them to put in a bed deck which expands that 7.5 square metres into 10 metres. So it kind of meets those HMO standards, but then it also has generous communal spaces as well and access to the external yard spaces as well and, and the workspace, dedicated workspace. So it's kind of an amalgamation of all those things to give people what they need across different rooms and different parts of the building and different parts of the site. And just to quickly add to that, um, we, we sort of set out the requirements of policy dm 39 which i think is undoubtedly one of our most lengthy and complex policies because it was sort of grappling with this unique type of development so um it has asked the developer to master plan um, and as part of that they've done an analysis of the, the warehouse district and looked at what people are living in at the moment and um, it has looked at hmo standards although that, that is a separate matter but um has integrated that into setting new standards for this that um build on, on what's there and, and what people um live in um you know the regulations that will have to be met and then distill that into this new form of development so um there you know, there's a lot of thought and research behind arriving at this place Alison Jameson I am um, so when we have a look um on front was it last Friday? Um, the original creative space, the warehouses had sort of um, they'd grown into that. They they were an uh, an organic thing, and people were happy, and they were obvious creative spaces. Um, and then we looked at Cara House and the actual living spaces that people have. Um, and the idea is wonderful of being able to have a, a living space and a workspace, but um, the rents matter. So on a single, so on a single place for a single person, it was nine fifty, wasn't it, for their single room? Is that right? What what was it for a, a double? And the commercial spaces are supposed to be affordable. So what are people looking at, really? Um, and also the whole plan is for single people or couples, but no children. That's it's, it's not really going to accommodate children, any, is it? Or like, or is that just a. People would just be of a different mindset and 
maybe have children within these spaces, but it's not really made for children in any way, any way is it at all. Um, no, I don't think that's necessarily the intention, but you know, there's no restriction necessarily on children not being in the building. Um, but that's not the intention. It's sort of more for people to have living and working space in one place. Um, and the affordability is sort of by its very nature because they have both those spaces in one. Because it does, it really does all matter. Um, you know, the maths all, all matters really so that um, so that ultimately it really is affordable because it's trying to mirror what has organically grown and it has been a real success. That creative space is a real success. Um, I, I have no idea what people pay or how they live or whatever, but it's it sort of matters if we're trying to copy copy that. Um, I mean, in the addendum, it men mentions the management plan. So, um, now, the management plan would have a management plan to start, but does the council have any obligation to revisit this management plan and oversee the management plan? Uh, the management plan's there, so, so, so they would need to outline exactly who it's going to, how they're marketing it, so how they're targeting those creative communities or people that work in the creative sector. Um, so that should set out what they would be doing on a continual basis to maintain that sort of in in the lifetime of the development. So they specifically relate to those two workspaces at below ground. So they would be dedicated spaces where people can do work. So they they might not always want to do that work in the sort of communal spaces in the building because there are other people there. So they could potentially do the messy and noisier stuff in those spaces where it's solely dedicated to to work. I mean, the, the 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 figures for the rents are at the upper end of the sort of spectrum in the warehouse district. But then this is new build development. And, um, you know, a lot of those buildings are past their sort of life lifespan. And then you're also getting some of the other public benefits through the scheme, through the commercial spaces and those public realm improvements um, linking uh, Seven Sisters Road to Chewsbury Road. Sorry, um, so the rents are 950 a month. That's the proposed rent. So is there a, a single rent and a double rent or for a double room? I mean, what, what's the difference, please? They haven't set the rents and they anticipate there likely will be some um, variance, you know, at different floor levels of the building and in different parts of the building, but they've run the viability on the basis that each room would be rented for £950. And that viability report supports, you know, the rest of the development and the infrastructure works and the public realm works. So if they were to sort of get any lower figure, then they wouldn't be able to necessarily deliver some of the other public benefits of the scheme. Um, Okay, so that that includes so that's live a live work concept, and that there are different spaces for if people want to do noisier work or what, whatever. There's there's different spaces for that. Can I just clarify that because I wasn't clear myself on that? Yeah, the workspaces below ground seven sisters aren't necessarily specifically for noisy works, but it just it's it's my assumption that they'd be more they could you know, have the capacity for those because it is a dedicated only workspace and there's no living at all in that area. Um, but generally warehouse living is by its nature can be noisy and, you know, it's communal, there's there's things going on. So there will be stuff like that going on in the rest of the building. Um, but it's just um, something I, I identified that there's that potential that they could do that within the building because they have a dedicated space for it. Okay, Councillor Joseph. So you have a sort of obvious problem in that um, if you live in one of the new buildings um, and there's some not uh, incorporated in your floor space, this nice big um, communal area that you could work in. Um, um, and if people occupy that, others are then forced to rent one of the containers. Um, do you see what I mean? There's 
you know, things can get complicated. I don't. I mean, Sorry, if, you're I don't... Doing, if you're doing something, I mean, people can sort of take over a communal space with a project that they're working on at that particular point rather than renting the, uh, you know, rather than renting one of the containers. Um, you know, so what, do you, so what do you question, Councillor Jameson, please? Sorry. Um, well, it, it, how how is that going to be managed? Because, yeah, essentially, how is that going to be managed? You know, because once you rent a rent rent a space there, you you are automatically allowed to use the communal areas. But once you're, if you have a project that gets too large, but you can't afford to buy the to use the um, commercial areas, the containers, you're 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 occupying all the communal communal space there's you know this happens yeah i think that's an existing thing that happens in the oh sorry that's an existing thing that happens in the warehouse districts at the moment so people share spaces and the projects grow out and you know they make it work they talk to each other it's part of that communal nature of the way of warehouse living um if they do need more space then they can potentially use one of those commercial container spaces or the yard spaces or you know they may have to use something else but that's just by its nature that's how it works people have to talk to each other and figure out who's going to use what and when that's kind of its nature hey, um councillor emery did you want to come in i did yeah i know councillor rice wanted to come in was it in relation to that point councillor rice or was it can I make my point and then you can go next? You make your you, you make your point. I don't want to chair the meeting for you. <laughs> yeah, well <laughs> exactly. Um uh, yeah, um there's two questions really. Um so multiple uh, people mentioned um in the um in the comments online that there's an outside space used by the cutting rooms. Just wanted to know what the legal case was was on that land, because a lot of them are claiming that it belongs to them, which is a little confused by. Um, second question, um, TfL made a late request for conditions they said need to be attached and I can't see them in the supplementary. Just wanted to know the, the progress of those, what the situation was with those TfL recommendations. So what was the TfL request? Is it somewhere in the pack that I can find a page or? In the comments. I've looked at it online, so I haven't got the page number. Give me a second. We'll come back to you, Councillor Emery, if you just want to. The second point. Can we go to the second point? Please? Second point, go on. Uh, yeah, so I think it's in relation to Cotton Mill Yard, what, what, what names Cotton Mill Yard. So, prove well, the landowners own lots of land holdings in SA34. So, it is there under their ownership. I think residents in cutting rooms have had access to that space before. And I think some of the objections raised concerns that they would no longer have access to that um, as part of the proposal. Um, specifically, the conditions, um, I might need to find it, but the conditions deal with that in that they require details to be submitted, which require details of access, how residents will be accessed. So, you know, they would need to show us that if residents from cutting rooms have requested access, that they've built that into the details of Cotton Mill Yard, basically. So that's kind of um, directly addressed in the conditions. Okay. Um, uh, the comment from TfL was from Mehmet Carney, if that helps. I mean, I, I don't know if it's related to TfL have made sort of requests in relation to sort of um, contributions to cycling infrastructure. You know, it was two days ago. It was to do with. Um, uh, demolition works. Can you tell us where it is, Councillor Emery? So, so I found it in the online pack. So, as in in the online comments of the section. All right. Well, look, we'll come back to that in a, in. A I'll bit. see if I can find the pack. See if you can find it, please, Councillor Rice. Yeah. Could you bring up the page that, that talks about proposed buildings? There's a page which says proposed building use. Sorry. Yeah. I think so. I mean, it's a multi jumble of buildings. How one is supposed to make sense of that? 
Where, where's the new building as opposed to the older building? Uh, the new building are the sort of darker blue buildings. It, Sorry? The new building is, are the darker blue buildings? So you can see Cara House sort of on the left. Uh, on the left hand side here, that's Car House. This is Ede Road, Seven Sisters Road at the front of the site. Where's the new building in relation to the buildings already there? So the new building is this dark. That. This is Block B, the four story Block B. Yeah. This is Car House and this is an existing building. And it seems to me from that photograph that the, the new building is overshadowing the, 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 the older building. Would you like to share with the committee your report on overshadowing? Yeah, so daylight, sunlight and overshadowing has been dealt with in the committee report um, and it's identified. But that it's not dealt with by this committee, it might dealt with the correspondence between you and whoever made it. But this is the committee that makes the decision. We need to have it before us. It's actually in the pack. Um, uh, which has been dealt with um, about overshadowing. If you want to refer Councillor Rice to the PAC, uh, to the point that you're trying to make, if you can... I you want can to ask that. my question in this committee, not the golf research at some point. This is the place that the decision made and I want to answer him now, here and now, before this committee. Can you switch off your microphone, please? Um, I think basically that um, uh, 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 essentially they've run daylight sunlight test and whilst there would be an impact on car house um, the impact isn't significant enough to say that it's got uh, can have an undue impact on the immunity so there's nothing there at the moment there will be something there there will be an impact but they would still have levels of daylight that are deemed to be acceptable. Could you not show me on that map the overshadowing or no, no overshadowing come to that. Caused this is by the new building or not caused by the new building. This is just a, a one image taken from the daylight sunlight report, but it just shows the buildings basically in 3D uh, just to give that sort of idea of the context. It doesn't show necessarily exactly how the sun would move around the site and what that would do to Cara House. But uh, the report does deal with that in the daylight sunlight chapters where it comes to the summary assessment that the impacts, whilst there would be an impact, those impacts would be acceptable. So there will be an impact, but that's acceptable according to you. Um, can we, sorry, can we just, can we refer in the pack to the, the paragraphs, please, on the overshadowing? And Councillor Rice, if you, if you can, um, Tell us in the pack where you've seen it. This, these are points of clarification. So, where is it in the pack about the overshadowing, please? Yeah, so it's 6.4, so from page 56, there were the impacts on immunity of adjoining occupiers, and yeah, then okay. from paragraph. You say it was? And so from paragraph 6.4.10, that's the daylighting and sunlight assessment. What what you say about six point four point five? That seems to be a damning report, doesn't it? Six point four point one zero. Four point five. Um, six. What's your, sorry. So, what's your question, councillor? Please. Sorry. What is your question, please? Sorry, I don't didn't get that comment. I said, what is your question, please, Councillor Rice? I already asked the question about three or four times. I, I, there should be no need for me to repeat it, but if you insist, I will repeat it. On 6.4.5, it does admit there will be some overshadowing 
caused by this development? Are you satisfied that the amenities are in place to deal with that difficulty? Uh, 6.4.5 is just an explanatory paragraph about how daylight and sunlight is assessed in buildings. But yeah, as officers, we're content that whilst there would be an impact, mm -hmm. that impact is comparable to other new developments in regeneration areas. And that's kind of how we've come to the view that it's an acceptable impact. So you're saying there will be an impact, you just had a grid on the barrier. That isn't um, no? that isn't what the office is saying. The office... Close to that anyway. Isn't it? Let's move on. Please. Can, I can ask just another question on, on another subject. Since you want to move away from the place. When we walked around the site on Friday, Friday, yes, uh, there were clearly cars parked every few hundred yards. Bumper to bumper cars all over the place. Is there any there's a parking restriction on this in this estate, the same that applies to normal estates, normal streets. It didn't appear to me so. Seem to have their own law that these were parking. Is a parking person here from the council? Okay. So we can bring Maurice in, please. The, uh, 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 Councillor Rice is talking about Overbury Road, which is which was um, very congested with cars. Uh, Councillor, um, as far as I'm concerned, the, the parking restrictions on road, there are CPZ in the area. I think if things were illegal at park, I think something we can address with our colleagues in parking. In relation to this development proposal, it, it will be car free in nature and that residents of this development will not be able to apply for on street car parking permit uh, in the future development proposal. Anything to do with the existing, I can refer to my colleagues in the parking sec uh, section to look at. But the parking arrangement at present bear no re no relationship to a CPZ area. We just park everywhere and every few hundred yards and every every inch it can get parking. It doesn't appear that CPZ has been enforced on the site. I think CPZ enforcement is something I can bring back to the colleagues about the enforcement of the CPZ. Yeah. But there is there is a CPZ in the area, uh, and the the operation area is sufficient enough for us to recommend a car free development for this site. So if we we're saying we don't think the current CPZ is being enforced yes. effectively, yes. I can take it back to uh, my colleagues in my new service, it was from that part of direct services, to make sure we get our traffic wardens down there and enforce the CPZ appropriately. I think that's something we can definitely take back. But in, in relation to this development pro proposal and the impacts it will have, we've assessed it on the basis that it will be a car free development. Uh, residents of the new development will not be entitled to apply for on-street car parking permit, which will mean that they should improve the existing uh, situation in terms of uh, parking overall. Thank you. OK, thank you. And yeah, if you could, we could have a look at the enforcement on Overbury Road. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I've got Councillor Bevan, please. Right, I'm good. Well, I hear that the HMO licensing thing is still to be resolved depending how things work out is that have i got that message correct from what was said about hmo licensing i think it's just a separate matter i think it was a discussion about what the use class is in the building so as a planning use class it's sui generis warehouse living if it needs subsequent licenses uh, for whatever reason then that may well be the case but it's not necessarily relevant to its planning use Right, and then just one minor point. I think there's a condition missing about TV satellite dishes, which we don't want the whole thing covered with dishes all over the place. So I think that's missing. And then a couple of other points. It talks about, on page 40, it talks about a liaison group. I'm assuming that's a group of local residents to work with the developers. Can you say something about that? And then it also mentions on page 42, water efficiency. Can you tell me something about that? How how are we going to ensure that? Because uh, I know the aim is now all these new developments have to use less water. How how is that uh, going to be sorted? And then lastly, on page fifty seven, it's a sunlight issue. It refers to two percentages. It says twenty seven percent and a fifteen percent. Now, when I read it, I couldn't work out 
which one is applying to this scheme. And I couldn't work out if we were applying the best one or the worst one. So can you just clarify that for me, please? And I would like to talk to the developers a bit later. I've got a few questions for them. Councillor, uh, on the um, aerials and telecommunications, um, we discussed this briefly before the meeting. Um, that is actually included um, on page uh, 125, condition 41. It's there. So my apologies, I, I didn't believe it was. Sorry, there, there is a condition about the liaison group that would include residents that they would have to set up uh, prior to starting works. Um, in terms of water efficiency, that just means that that requirement, when they come to do building regulations, they would have to meet that requirement. If it's not put on as a planning condition, then they uh, potentially could have a sort of worse level of water efficiency. Um, the way the daylight sunlight works is that in the BRE guidance, um, it uses 27% uh, as sort of a figure. Basically, often in urban areas like London, a target alternative target is of 15% is used just because it's a more built up and um, sort of uh, dense urban location where the expectation of levels of daylight is slightly lower. And that's been applied in this instance because it's more comparable to uh, the existing area, but also regeneration areas in the borough and places like Woodbury Down and places where there would be lower levels of daylight. OK, so how how will the residents or the people, businesses be chosen to go on that liaison group? Who's going to choose them or how's that going to work? It's just so it's our typical sort of condition that we apply to set up that liaison group. So it, it would work the same as it would for any other sort of planning application. Um, condition 40, just like a few other page. Two, four. Mm -hmm. So I'll quickly take that page, uh, page one, two, four is just what the condition is, but um, the uh, requirement is that the terms of reference are submitted to and approved by the local planning authority. So um, when we've seen those recently, that includes how they'll select people to, um, to join that group. So, um, you know, reaching out to local businesses or um, or local residents. And if, um, you know, there's there's more interested than um, there are places, how they'll select them, things like that. So we do get to cast an eye over that. And, um, you know, from what we've seen on, on other sites, um, you know, they're generally broadly acceptable. They, they, they genuinely want to engage with the right people and um, and um, the interested parties. Um, and those, you know, are, are usually fairly apparent. So um, there's not often much tension between what they put forward and, and what we'd accept. Um, I think that's covered all of your questions, Councillor Bevan. Um, Councillor Collette. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a, a few sort of questions and, and a couple of little comments as well. Um, I'm just wondering what sort of demographic and age group are you looking at actually um, living in these spaces? Um, I have a concern that um, <clears throat> it will be um, difficult for women to live in them for any length of time um, because they might want to have families and there's no possibility of an expansion within that. Um, <clears throat> so it seems to me to be detrimental for women. Um, I, I've i lived in a couple of warehouse um, work live spaces in the 80s. They were very much organic um, developments of people work, who knew each other, finding spaces to live and work together. Um, so would be um, following common creative goals. Um, it seems to be quite a difficult thing to man manufacture that um, because people will be having um, using different materials. So within the communal workspace, what provision do we have for the use of hazardous materials? Um, what extraction facilities are there? Say, for instance, I'm there making a lovely costume and somebody comes in with some spray paint. What what protects me from that? Um, um, 
And um, could you please give me, I'm sorry, I'm sure it's in the pack, the actual square footage of the communal workspace and just clarify for me, the kitchen dining area, is that also within that communal space? Thank you. Um, so in terms of demographic, I think the focus is just on people working as creatives. So it's not necessarily got an age attached to it. It's just people working in the creative sector. Um, they've obviously done a, a big master planning exercise, which has talked to people in the community. Um, so they've, you know, consulted with them and talked about the spaces and then they formulated those spaces as a result and issues in terms of um, women living there or problems with that haven't arisen and um, so that's not come out of that exercise uh, in terms of extraction there is a, a condition on there for extraction but i think it might uh, relate specifically to the cafe space but i'm sure that could be extended to some of the workspaces the, work, the dedicated workspaces um so that's potentially something we could add um and the final question sorry if you could just say that again is the sort of students okay I, I don't think i've got the exact square footage to hand so the the sort of smaller units would have one shared space and then the larger units have that double height space where it's sort of got the kitchen area which can also function as living space but then also the am amenity space as well um sorry to clarify they're, they're two separate things so you've got your communal dining kitchen space and a communal workspace in addition. Yeah, so there's those two dedicated workspaces below ground, um, kind of as the building topography. So that's the there. 3000 square foot. There are about 150 square meters combined, those two spaces uh, underneath sort of below Seven Sisters Road. Um, but the idea with warehouse living is that you would be living and working within your unit. Um, but like I said before, if you're doing particularly noisy or, um, you know, like you said, uh, works that will require extraction, then potentially that could be done in the space below ground. And um, I think we can, I'm going to bring the applicant in, so I think we'll get the applicant to mm -hmm. um, to clarify um, those, those points, um, please. Um, so can I ask the applicant, please, to come? Can you, Maurice, do you mind? Yes, please. Chair. So there are, Councillor Bevan had some... Right. So just before I bring you in, have you got your point about? Yeah, the, the good news is that I find my comment and I also found that it's been resolved. Page 229. Thank you. All right. Right. Um, so, Councillor, right, let's just start. So we're talking about how big is the communal space? What's the square footage of the communal space and provision or provision for hazardous materials? Can we just, can you clarify those two points first? We can, um, I mean, we can do that first, or we, but we will try and pick up the points that you've been raising around the table, um, that we're keeping a, we're keeping a log of them. So we will try and address the questions that have been asked, um, where there might be more to say, but would you like to pick up this specific point first on the area? Please, yeah. All right, I'll ask David, the architect, he should know. You put your microphone. <laughs> but while they're checking that, so I will just say there, so there is uh, the two component parts to it in this building, um, and I'll talk a bit later a bit about the other buildings in the in the estate. So here we have. Uh, for each group of rooms, we have uh, a large shared space that will have within it, to, uh, to, um, generally, it will have a kitchen area and it will have a dining area and then have a shared workspace. Um, and that will be sort of commensurate with the number of rooms that surround that space. It's slightly larger on some of the upper levels, uh, a slightly smaller on some of the, um, the, the lower ones. Also, in this case, we're also providing shared workspace at the base of the building. That's within the, the, the dedicated business space area. So actually we're providing 
um, a, a wider range of shared spaces in this instance than is the case in most of the existing buildings. And I think the difficulty they're having is that those those areas vary slightly from floor to floor, yeah. uh, as do the, the number and the sizes of the rooms. Should we come back to that? So, to, what, what, uh, can I come back to that point? We won't lose sight of it. And perhaps I could just, if it's helpful, just give a quick run through, a bit of background and pick up some of the points that were raised in questions, if that's okay. helpful. Yeah, just a few minutes. So just say it's a bit of a coming of age moment, really, this for the Warehouse District, because I think it was touched on earlier, it has evolved from uh, redundant warehouse and industrial buildings. So when they were fir the first buildings were acquired by Provewell, uh, one of them was squatted. And of course, you know, the initial um, response was to remove the squatters from the building. It quickly became apparent that people were living and working there and doing all manner of useful and interesting things. And so really in, in, in regularising that, what then happened is that the next building, which at the time for, for which there was very little commercial demand at that point, we adapted in a similar way to the one that had already been carved out by the artists and the artisans who worked within that. And really, that's the pattern that we followed building by building. As we've gone from building to building, I think it's become more sophisticated, it's become more professionalised. But we were conscious some years ago, we were still falling short of the uh, regulatory standards that the council would expect. And then we had this sort of clashing plates period when the, the council was seeking to enforce against uh, the warehouse district. I think what came out of that was a recognition that we needed to improve our standards in all of these buildings and create um, spaces that conform to a given set of standards. Um, and that was really where the, the whole HMO reference came in, because HMO was really a sort of a reference point for a, a set of at least minimum standards, in many cases of which we, we exceed and went on to exceed. To do that required more and more investment in the, in the existing buildings. And we did that um, on a case by case basis so that each building really became quite bespoke. So the, the arrangement of spaces within the building conformed in part to the nature of the building we were working with. Some were high bay um, and large volume warehouse buildings, others were more uh, traditional um, industrial floor spaces. And also it was conditioned by what people were doing in these buildings. So we had people who you know, people who are artists, people who do circus skills, people who are in fashion, people who are in theatre productions, people who who are in cryptocurrency. Um, uh, well, you, know, you, you name it, there are journalists in there and there are painters and the sculptors and so on. So each building would have some characteristics related to the predominant activities within that building. And then what happened over time is people sort of find their group within the area related to people who do compatible things um, uh, in spaces that are conducive to that particular pursuit. And for that reason, we don't absolutely would not have somebody spray painting a vehicle in a building where somebody else is doing couture work on um, on, on fashion products. So that's been something that as a landlord, we take a relatively light touch, but people, people find their way through this and engage in activities um, in, in a way that supports communal living and communal working and sort of internally and mutually supportive groups of, of people. Um, we've always known that when we run out of buildings to adapt, to keep this model alive, we would have to build from scratch and we'd have to build something new. And we didn't want to build something which was modern and sanitized and soulless. We wanted to keep the spirit uh, of what existed across the area going within that. So the piece of work we produced with, the, I have to say that absolutely uh, active um, and creative assistance of officers here was to put a framework together across the area in which we try to map what goes on in the area and try and define the sort of essential characteristics of it, but in such a way that we could produce further buildings which would themselves be as disparate and as as interesting as the buildings that we found in, in the area. And that uh, that framework for the warehouse district, we've got a copy of it down here and some of you will have seen it, I think has given us the prompts and the sort of starting points from which the schemes evolved. It took us a while, I think it's fair to say, to find an architect that could work with this. It, it is unique. As far as we know, you are the only borough that has put a, a red line around an area and said this will be a warehouse district and people will live and work in communal circumstances in buildings adapted for that purpose. I don't think anybody else has done it. Um, we were very pleased. We, we won a major award from the GLA 
uh, recently, which was a reflection of the work of the council and uh, and prove well here, which sort of recognised the importance and the value of this. But we have at the moment already over a thousand people living and working in the area who you know place great value on the um, on the spaces that that are provided. But what we found in David and his team at Morrison Company was a group of architects who were willing to take this on and try and invent it against the backdrop of that framework. I was just going to ask David to say a few words about how he's gone about this task. Uh, OK, just just a few, a couple of minutes, because I do want to come to the questions yeah. that we've got. Um, yes, I think, you know, so David Storing, uh, Morrison Company director um, on the project. I mean, from an architectural perspective, this project is uh, an amazing opportunity, as we say, to you know create something new and really exciting uh, within this site. And I think you know, for us as architects, as, as Chris says, really unique, um, and we really had to understand the DNA of what warehouse living is. And it's not HMO. I mean, that's kind of it's really not that. If you walk around it, you'll, you'll you'll know it's all about generosity. Um, that's the kind of that's the key and community community and the ability of people to come together and really form long term 30 year communities. And that's what we really want to build on. And, and that's come through, you know, we've got this massive framework document that's been developed um, with the council and uh, with the team. And then we've we've been brought on board. We've been talking with the residents. We've walked around all those spaces. We've measured them. We've tried to understand them. We tried to distill them. Um, and we believe that this scheme is, you know, is a sustainable solution to it, enhancing the overall district. This it establishes a marker building, which is key to give the building both presence um, and uh, within the wider community. Um, I think it comes down to this kind of set of ingredients, and I think we talked a lot about this um, and and what makes this unique, um, this distinctive character. And we're building on that. And I'll just really kind of I'll go through those because I think it sort of counters a lot of these concerns about this idea of HMO. Um, but we used HMO as just something to start from, and we always talked about it's HMO plus plus plus. It's kind of it's a place to build upon. Um, so the kind of the variety of the units, units, the kind of sizes, the types of spaces, um, really critical, and kind of you know to match these kind of different types of spaces, different types of users that then form different communities around them. And you'll find, you know, we went into one unit where there were a series of of people into into um, couture and fabric, and they all come together. So there isn't someone there kind of. There's a different unit where there's a load of people who are building bicycles and you know doing that sort of stuff. And these these types of really unique communities come together, um, but then they also come together as one as a wider community within these larger shared spaces. Uh, the next point is the um, generosity and spaciousness, um, and I think the kind of this this idea of volume is really critical. And it's come out of again, it's come out of this org organic uh, warehouse, but this ability to have a bed deck above your bedroom, you know, just by increasing and allowing that generosity, suddenly you get a studio with a bed above. Um, but that also plays out in the uh, in the communal spaces as well, in terms of what 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 things can happen there. Everything from kind of full band setups in one unit uh, through to kind of you know a series of kind of workbenches in another unit. And again, these kind of these are formed by these longer term communities um, within each of the units, and they're all really distinct. Um, empowering the residents. This is really key and a real challenge within meeting the kind of um, uh, high standards of, of fire, etc. So we've we've looked at a kind of really durable materials to give a canvas for residents so that they can take it on and, and they can customize it and make it into their into their own spaces. All of the other kind of the, the opportunity here of a new build was to provide a, a sustainable building, kind of tackling a lot of the other concerns that come through from the residents. So all about insulation, everything's electric. We're dealing with solar shading. That's becoming an integral part of the of the facade with these um, solar shading. So it's all about comfort, um, improving energy efficiency and again, sort of uh, reducing cost in the in the mix. And then affordability. I mean, this is the one, you know, every time that we are meeting with uh, with residents, this is kind of you know the the topic within a really complex site. So we've worked really hard to use lean design principles to drive that affordability in terms of the build. But this kind of inherent generosity of the ability to live, work within the same spaces, effectively, this is the kind of you know this is the sort of magic of the generosity that we're providing through the scheme. And it's not it's not HMO. I mean, just on the living space, um, we are for the kind of fourteen bed units. We've got. 45 meters on this ground floor space and then another 25 meters above. So it's like 70 meters overall, which equates to five meters per person. And that's kind of reflected through the scheme. But that's, you know, I think you've got to remember when we walked around Cara House, we spoke to the residents. There was a kind of 
they were like the the capacity is never at full so this generosity through sharing with larger units means that you know there was an artist who had their work out on the table when we went around there so these spaces and the sharing is is the generosity i mean i could talk through the scheme but that's the kind of let me maybe. I, I'm, I'm i'm conscious of time yeah. let me bring councillor bevan in and and then maybe you can bring in some of the points when you ask his, his questions yeah. councillor bevan please yeah, I mean, in the past, these type of units, what shall I say, they've always been a bit ad hoc. They haven't had much management, etc. And we got the message that these people have to pay rent. They'll have to pay business rates instead of council tax. And they become, I don't even want to clarify that, but they become really, because they're going to be managed properly, they become quite expensive. And they're quite complex to manage with all this is quite a complex management operation. So I'm just wondering how you're going to do that. Do you have the, the capacity to do it? And I notice in this report, the word risk is used several times. I'm just wondering the crime uh, standards for the designing out crime. What standard are you going to? Because there's several standards. And then the last point, if you could just bring up figure 11, on the screen because I would just like to make a few comments about that. Um, so I think in in terms of um, so in relation to your, so your first point in terms of the, the management uh, of this, I mean, it has we've tried to be light touch, but, but that's it's benign light touch. I mean, it's not neglectful light touch. The the idea was to provide spaces within within which groups of people manage the, their own circumstances and of course as a as a landlord we will become involved if there's a dispute or if a, if a problem arises uh, but it happens really vanishingly rarely um, people within this area people who tend to live within these communal circumstances are people who um, are accustomed to the idea of a bit of give and take and uh, and being considerate of the other people they live with and, and we genuinely find it really quite rare for but for disputes to arise. So I, I think one could one, one could overstate that. In terms of day-to-day -day management, I mean, we have uh, we have people on site, we manage the, the common spaces, uh, we deal with day-to-day -day responsive repairs. What we've had to do over time, of course, is we've had to do much more substantial refurbishments of the buildings. And that's been in order to, to bring them up to the standards that are now required and using HMO as a baseline, but layered on top of that are, are fire issues and so on, then that has required uh, investment in the buildings. And what we've tried to do all the way through is to manage a balanced position, improve the buildings, expend money on the buildings, but keep the rents at a level that they, uh, they're they not an impediment to people moving in and living in, and working in the district. And I think we've been, I think we've been very successful at that to the extent that the the occupational levels um, uh, across the buildings uh, and, the, and the constant waiting list suggest that people still want to come and want to live here. Um, uh, but we also have the fact that we have slow turnover. Uh, people are routinely staying in this area for five, six, seven years. It's not, it's not, it's not people coming in for one year and moving on. We haven't got the kind of co-working turnover. People settle in for quite lengthy periods of time. And part of the reason that we've built some new workspaces off over, over Bree Road is to meet the demand from people who want to carry on living in the district, but want to expand their business out of the common shared area and into a, into a space of their own. Um, so I think that's been in relation to the the risk point. Um, do you want to pick that up, David? Sure. Yeah, that's only a bit clarity over that. Just in terms of, do you want to just clarify what you meant in terms of? It's not our report, obviously, but it's. Well, in terms of, I, I can't speak for the report uh, per se, but in terms of managing the risk in the building, as I said before, this is the first time that we have uh, proposed to build uh, a new warehouse living building from scratch. And clearly in the course of doing that, we are meeting every relevant standard, um, both in terms of the sustainability of the building, the performance of the building, the safety of the building, we're meeting all of the current fire regulations and everything else. So I, I would, um, one should never discount risk, but uh, I think if having achieved compliance with every regime related to those factors, um, I hope you wouldn't think that we're um, creating a risk. And is how does the business rates? So in terms of rates, our, 
our residents pay council tax, uh, not business rates. They pay council tax. They live there and operate within their shared spaces. The council tax covers the cost of um, the, the standard services that the council provides, including uh, domestic bin um, emptying. But in terms of commercial spaces, we provide um, commercial arrangements to have those bins and that waste collected. In terms of managing the space between the buildings, uh, we do that because we're not dealing with adopted public highways. The only issue of public highway that we, we have is where the a formal road runs through over a B Road, Chooksbury Road, and also the issue which you might want to touch on about the alleyway, which you can see in the diagram there. But across the rest of the area, that's picked up by us uh, as a management cost that isn't charged back onto tenants. Um, that's all included within the uh, the monthly rent that they pay. In the figure 11, so this is what gave me concern last time because this is this is a gateway to Haringey actually, this site. Obviously you've improved it some before. I think it's going to be some kind of concrete panels. It's not uh, referred to in here. I, I mean, is those glass bits, they're not going to get lumbered with loads of junk. They can't put junk there's no balconies though, so they can't fill them with junk. They're not going to become an eyesore. And all the, the concrete panels or whatever they're called by your architects, they're not going to become discoloured with all the vehicle fumes and all that type of thing. It's going to, is it going to remain looking in a really good pristine condition for many, many, many years? Perhaps, yeah, perhaps I'll answer that one. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of just talk through the kind of the, the, the kind of design development on that. Um, so effectively, you know, this this uh, building its facade has been kind of uh, developed through extensive research of local materials, colour, sampling and understanding kind of these architectural features. Um, and, the, you know, the, the really key thing here was that this building was part of the warehouse district, um, but also addressing sustainability concerns. I mean, and, and the idea that this building needed to be a marker building and that was set out by the council uh, clearly as a marker building, both to um, enable wayfinding through into the warehouse district, but also within the wider community, which we are you know, addressing with the new works to the alley. Um, the residents, you know, we, we did a lot of work with the residents. They were very vocal over this building looking like a generic development. Um, so this had to be something very different. So we did a lot of research and my, myself, I head up sustainability for the practice as well. And we did lots of uh, research into different materials. And we we looked at everything from brick to metal cladding, you name it. And we stumbled upon this um, cementitious profile board, uh, which reflected the rhythms within the warehouse, but actually is incredibly low carbon. This is a product, you know, with warranties, et cetera. It's a kind of tested product. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's robust in that fashion, but it has that relationship back to the warehouse district. And it's also low carbon. So it's a sustainable, robust material. Um, and this is a material, you know, this this material, this this facade, we've we've presented it to the residents and they feel that it does sit with the DNA of the warehouse district. Uh, and that's critical um, in terms of it being part and not kind of rejected by the warehouse district and being being that marker building for uh, the warehouse district. Um, and then. Yeah, so I mean that's, that's <laughs> so basically, I mean, it it will it will look good. For yeah. a, it's a it's a product. It's not you know this is a yeah. the modern product um, designed to be used as as cladding. Okay, and I think the point about the balconies mm -hmm. that people won't be allowed to. And as you know, I'm keen on lots of planting. Yeah, again. and greenery. But um, Councillor Bevan didn't is saying about the balconies just being filled up with lots of junk. I think was your words, Councillor Bevan. So can you address that point, please? We'll yeah. OK. Um, yes. I mean, external amenity for the residents was a key consideration for the scheme. Um, and these are, as you see there on this prominent corner, um, we've um, emphasised the kind of generosity of this scheme through these double height glazed screens. And beyond that, unfortunately, there's not a visual here, but this is the double height space for that unit, which comprises, you know, a mix of, of, of work, live, dining space on the upper mezzanine. They're quite they're really special spaces. And the idea is that you get a glimpse into those. And then in front of that, that space spills out onto a balcony and that's got a raised parapet to it. And that's about making sure that, that space, you know, feels um, 
it's, it's not kind of see it's not see through balustrade effectively. So you're not going to see stuff in front of that. But we do hope it's being built robust enough that they can put planters out there and have nice trees uh, outside there. Yes. And, and I just wanted to add it, uh, added to that point. Somebody touched on the triangle of land at the back at the bottom of Tewkesbury Road. Well, actually, we're not taking we're not taking a garden area away. What we're doing is we're putting bicycle parking in there and and re landscaping it and be for the use of for all of the um, all of the tenants and residents around this area. Uh, you're right. We don't want bicycles on the balconies. We want people to use the dedicated bicycle space, and we're putting a lot of those in. Um, as I said before, we we try not to tell people how to live. That isn't that isn't our role. But I have to say, if junk started to accumulate on a balcony, we would be. Uh, down telling but I would be amazed if we needed to do so these big generous windows will go, they'll bring a lot of light in they'll give great views out um I, 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 apart from growing plants in front of them I can't think that anybody would want to want to block them but I, I would say to you if you ask me in extremis yes we would intervene okay right I want to bring this to a close now so are are there any other quick questions Points. Quick questions. OK, Councillor Donovan. Thank you. Um, this scheme, is, as always, has been subject to question, a, a question, Councillor Don question, Donovan. Yeah. All right, go on. It's been subject to a viability scheme, and because of that, I understand there's no affordability in terms of housing. Um, in terms of the National Health Service, um, in, in the pack, the National Health Service, you know the pressure in Tottenham on their health service, they're saying because of the um, increased number of people, they're, they're, um, they estimate um, a contribution of £65,000 would be reasonable. Again, in the says it, because of viability, that's not possible. But is it... Is it impossible in this multi-million pound project that a voluntary contribution to the local national health service is sixty-five thousand pounds? Is that really impossible? Thank you. Well, I think I mean taking a broader point, uh, the, the issue we've tried to balance here is it's it's an expensive building and in a way it's an inefficient building for the reasons that David's described as its virtues. It has big open spaces, it has big volumes. It doesn't contain as much accommodation as it would if we were if we were an HMO, for instance, because it would be much tighter. And at the same time, we're trying to keep our, our rents to the lowest level that, that we can. So we are treading a bit of a, a tightrope. What we have said is that if by the time we do the review, it outperforms expectations, then we will be making a contribution. Now, strictly, just without wanting to get lost in this, the point you made at the beginning was correct when you talked about it being a sui generis use. It's not a housing use. And then for you know, normal circumstances, sui generis use would not be delivering affordable housing. But we're not we're not here to say that. We're we're saying that the principle that if this scheme can afford it, it should make greater contributions, um, I, I, is one we accept and we and, and we will stand by. If those extra sums come through, frankly, whether they go to into your affordable housing fund or they go to more health provision in the area, what I think is ultimately a, a decision for the council to decide where you where you direct those funds. Um, but if, if it performs well, it will make further it will make further contributions, and will be in your hands about where you direct that. Okay, I'll bring Robbie McNuckery. Yeah, just to be clear, so the, there is what's known as a late stage review, so that um, shows that if the um, applicant achieves a better result in terms of viability, so if build costs reduce um, and our values go up, then we get a contribution uh, towards affordable housing. Um, our recommendation is that that contribution goes to affordable housing. I, I don't think it would necessarily be appropriate for it to go to the NHS. Um, that, that's not really allowed for in that viability policy, strictly speaking, I would say. Thank you. Uh, quick question, Councillor Jameson. Can you put your microphone on? Do the rents include utility bills? Um, and I, I still wasn't quite sure what happened with the sing, single rooms and double rooms, what the sort of difference for rent is. So if you, you know, they used to say two live as cheap as one, but do they? No, I'll try and help with that. So the um, the, the, the £950, which you talked about, now, now that, that's the result of conversations with the council and with the council's own viability advisors. It's a higher level than um, prevailing 
uh, rents in the area. So, you know, our, most of our existing buildings will, will always be cheaper than that. And people have options to be in, in buildings that in spaces that cost less. This is this is a brand new build. It is a, it's a build. It's a it's a higher cost building. It's a more efficient building. It's a it's one I suspect people we've agreed would accept that they probably would pay more to be in. The 950 was just a sort of standardized average figure across all of the rooms. Uh, double rooms would be would be a bit higher, smaller rooms would, would be a bit less. It would, we're just looking at an average rate across the across the whole scheme. That's what that's been derived from. And that provides for your, your room plus the, your share of all the communal spaces, plus your share of the additional business spaces um, down at the ground floor. In this case, we think we'll be providing um, heating and, and the like into the building on a communal basis. So that will be that will be an all inclusive um, proposal for tenants. So they won't be finding that they're hit with with hidden costs and the general wider estate management costs that I mentioned before uh, are picked up by us as part of that, you know, our, our overall cost of management of the of the estate. So okay. does, that, does that help? Yeah, your... that that answers the question. OK, right. Thank you. So we're now moving. Um, I want to move to the recommendation. So I'd like to ask Robbie McNocker to confirm the recommendation with a summary of any changes. Thank you, Chair. Um, the only change I would recommend is just a condition four, which uh, controls um, the extraction equipment to broaden that to include um, all of the commercial spaces. Um, so not just the cafe spaces, um, as mentioned by Professor Collette earlier. So therefore, the recommendation um, is to grant planning permission subject um, to a section 106 and referral to the JLA as set out in the pack and um, the addendum and with that change to the condition. So we'll now move to the vote. So the recommendation is to grant. So all those in favour, please show. OK, any anyone against? Any abstentions? No, oh, OK, that's carried then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So we're now moving on then to the pre-application briefings. So we're on to item 10, um, which is 30 to 48 Lawrence Road. That's pages 329 to 350 in the pack. And the proposal is on the agenda. Um, and can I get the planning officer to introduce this application, please? Uh, good evening, Chair. Um, this is a pre-application briefing for 30 to 48 Lawrence Road. Um, it's a partial demolition and refurbishment of an existing light industrial building and erection of, res of a residential building, including ground floor workspace, cycle parking, hard and soft landscaping and associated works. Um, the applicant has had several meetings with planning officers over the last year. Uh, the site has been taken to a quality review panel. The current the current iteration of the scheme has been taken twice, including a chair's review recently. Uh, last week, there was also a DM forum. Just to give some uh, context to the site, um, the site is located uh, northwest of Seven Sisters, um, just north of Philip Lane on Lawrence Road. Um, next to Lawrence Road is the Clyde Circus Conservation Area. The site is just outside it, it backs onto it. Um, there are no listed buildings um, or locally listed buildings on the site and it's just outside the conservation area. Um, in terms of the site, we're looking here to uh, the east and there's the existing light industrial uh, building which is to the back, uh, Fort Court to the front and to the front of that there's um, of office spaces, which is uh, proposed to be redeveloped. 
Um, this is one of the final um, pieces of the puzzle in terms of um, Lawrence Road, which is a site allocation. So in terms of the remainder of the site, um, the site allocation EO marks this for uh, mixed use um, development with commercial uses on the ground floor uh, with residential above. Um, and this application reflects that. So if I could just hand over to the developer. Uh, good evening and thank you for uh, having us today. I'm Sam Hine from DP9 with the planning agents. So on my left is David Pollock representing Linden, the, uh, the site owners and our architect Michael Linus. Um, but we're going to try and keep this to 15 minutes, uh, which I think is what we were asked to do. Um, and I'll just say a few words and then Michael would take, uh, David will talk a little bit about the aspirations for the site and then Michael on the, on the design. Um, so the site is a commercial building um, which is to be vacated by the dry cleaning industry that works there at the moment. It's probably best known for the constant stream of vans coming into and from, from the site, uh, probably for the, the generator which generates the, the noise which is in a small building at the front of the site and the uh, the fumes that come out of it. So there's a clear opportunity to kind of tidy up the site and do something very different with it. And as you heard before, it is the last piece in the jigsaw for Lawrence Road, that piece of regeneration the council have been seeking for many, many years. It's the last site of the allocation and it's great that it's, it's now able to come forward. Um, we have looked at a lot, a lot of different options to get to this stage. Uh, we'll talk to you only today about where we've got to, but there's been a long journey and we have, as you've heard, we've spent, met the DRP, um, the QRP and the chair. We've met the development management forum. We've met your planning, design, economic uh, development, sustainability, transport. Everybody's been involved in the process to get to what we think is the optimal scheme that is looking to balance lots of different things, jobs, over 100 jobs, homes, affordable housing, and good design. So hopefully you'll uh, you'll appreciate that the world has gone into that and we'll um, I will hand over to David just on the next slide just to explain the uh, uh, who, who our client is. Um, so we effectively purchase land without planning. We get the planning and we like to develop flats and commercial and the commercial we always range further we take. Um, and we normally fill it with sort of local employment. You can see from the slide there a number of schemes that we carried out recently, probably building in total something like 300 flats and a circa 200,000 square feet of commercial in the schemes that you see there. Uh, we are sort of marketing them as an end of new developments. We like to build them ourselves, uh, employing our own contractors, um, and as I, as I said, maintain these these commercial elements. Uh, normally, in lots of small individual units, uh, which normally filled up with local um, employment rather than them having to do a great big scheme and just go to them to. Uh, a Tesco's or somebody else along that line. But it's in all the Tesco's. Okay. In responding to the sites, as as David mentioned, we've we've brought a, a product along that combines that commercial and, and residential use. And as we heard earlier as well, it's the missing. It's the missing tooth in the mouth here. Um, we sit next to number 28, the bottom left hand building, which is is considered the sort of the old building in the street. Um, it's got some nice brick de detailing. And on the other side, we have the recently completed Vable Lawrence scheme, um, which we're putting up to. Um, I think it's it's been mentioned, the process we've been through over the last year, meeting with the planning officers um, several times in the QRP. And we've recently completed two consultation evenings with the public um, where we we've shown them what we're showing you tonight um, and, and quite generally a positive response. The normal questions on car parking and daylighting, um, but we've managed to answer those. Um, the proposal that we've arrived at recently or, or, or uh, in the in the last sort of half the year, I guess, 
is one that reuses the existing commercial building. We'd previously discussed options to demolish and develop the whole site for um, uh, completely new. Uh, we felt from a sustainability point of view, from a, a sensible development point of view, we would look to retain where the blue dotted line is on the on the old building there. We retain that. We take the front of the site, redevelop it as a residential block, and we allow the rear building to do the the commercial entity to it. Um, this this uh, has changed the scheme somewhat, and it, and it and it brings opportunities. One of which is that it it helps us to go from the scale of Lawrence Road, where we're matching the seven stories uh, protocol along the street and the warehouse itself or the, the, the commercial building allows that sort of connection to um, Hollingwood Road at the rear. Um, and the, as I said, the, the building at the front sits on Lawrence Road, completes that gap, addresses the scale of number 28 to the left and the veil scheme to the right in a contemporary quite simple form brick building with uh, sort of a, a regular pattern across it in, in uh, and um, dark coloured uh, metalwork uh, balconies. Um, this uh, this goes on just to say how we've we've split the building. We've managed to just give the massing a little bit of a an individuality in the streets by bringing a section of it forward next to number 28 and reflecting the the massing and some of the brick detailing from that the building to the north and then we've stepped it back to respect the sort of line that's being brought up through the verbal scheme and is consistent along the street a little bit of detailing on the brick on the metalwork um and the brickwork showing the ground floor, um, which I'll come on to in a second. So we've connected through on the ground floor. Obviously, we have the residential entrances. We have a north, north and a south residential core, which connect up to the to the building above um, for the residents. That central uh, multifunction servicing yard in the in the middle is protected on the street with a uh, well-designed gates, but that provides the off street servicing to the potential commercial use. So the, the building to the rear, we've allowed for a single tenant that has a similar, but probably scaled down model to the current occupier to um, a sort of a, a uh, a co-working product or some uh, and there's there's lots of different uses we could put in there and therefore the servicing of that has been left flexible but has been dealt with through the design the bins and the bikes come with the residential the bins can be collected through that that central or as well and that separates the environment for the resident the residents um, entrance and, and the servicing of the building. We've also included some small workspaces to the front to activate that frontage. Um, above that, we have six floors of, of uh, apartments, the majority of which are dual aspect arranged, as you see here, with deck access to the rear um, and balconies to each unit that focused on on a sort of good quality layout through discussions with the planning officers and the qrp we've developed this uh, this approach with the deck access it has the two cores for the uh for the fire considerations now and then we've stepped back at sixth floor um to to mirror the massing of, of next door buildings. <clears throat> As I mentioned, with 
maintaining the the building on site and we've previously looked at options to create basements um, and looked at the level of development on site we now have a very sustainable approach where we shouldn't need to bring any materials off site the the small portion of building that we demolish and as we take up the concrete hard standing we can use all that on site and we can limit the amount of materials taken away thus we reduce the embodied carbon in the overall project and less disturbance to the to the local residents during construction passive design is key to the to the new build we have low u values low m permeability source heat pumps and uh, mechanical ventilation heat recovery to all the flats meaning bills are cheap uh, running costs are low the building is um, efficient and solar pvs the uh, photovoltaics we'll put on the commercial building to the rear where it captures the the most sun and we can use that and reduce the overall co2 um in line with sort of part l standards amenity space has been a, a topic we've discussed with planning officers in the qrp and we have two spaces so we have three spaces actually we have the first floor podium um, that sort of sits between the two buildings and that will be used for the young play the younger sort of um, allocation of play space and the rooftop will and the whole of the rooftop will become an amenity space and communal community gardening um, so we're using that all the green space efficiently on on the site um, as the one of the diagrams at the beginning showed we've picked four townscape views to assess the scheme on and we've demonstrated that through the iterations that we've discussed uh, over the last 12 months and we've these four views show the different the views shown in the bottom left hand corner there so collingwood road nelson road view which is view two uh, and then lawrence from lawrence road from the south and the north so we see how it it fits in and, and uh sits into the site could you could you start to um Rapid. wind up now please yeah daylight has been tested to bre um and our our consultant has has matched our work and and, and tested it throughout for overshadowing and good level of daylights for the neighbors and for ourselves or for our new tenants and servicing and transport i mentioned earlier so i won't do too much on that obviously it will be uh permit free um in terms of car parking and we don't have any car parking on site and then sam do you want to pick up on um affordable? Okay, yes, yeah, thank you. So, um, thank you very much. So, are there any clarification questions, please, Councillor Bevan? Yeah. On page 331, it refers to narrow, narrow dump dimensions of single aspect flats should be reconsidered. I don't know if that's been done. Uh, it would be nice if some of the style and the colours materials could have some link to all the other developments that have been done in this road rather than i mean i know that picture is probably totally divorced from reality but it looks like a huge big dark brown block and my recollection is most of the developments along lawrence road are not of that type perhaps it's my personal opinion but it would be nice if there could be a bit of uniformity along the whole road uh and I think I'm aware also now the mayor, these are shared ownership, yeah? And I, the, the flats are shared ownership? Yeah, yeah. And I think the mayor of London is now saying that for those type of flats to be uh, permissible, 
the cost of the mortgage, the cost of the service charge and the cost of the rent combined should not exceed 40% of the occupier's salary. I'm assuming that salary is based on the area that this development is. So I don't know whether you've taken that into account and whether officers can comment on that. And then the other point is I note only 19% affordable housing is provided. Um, so in terms of the shared ownership levels, there has been discussions between um, our consultants and the council's housing department. So we understand where the priorities are and the, the caps and, and that work is ongoing. The final detail is still to be resolved, but we're aware of the, the guidance on that front. In terms of affordable housing, yeah, you're correct. We're looking at, we're, it's an ongoing viability review process with the council's independent assessors at the moment. There's a range between 14 to 19% of affordable housing. That would be up to nine units, which would be in shared ownership. We, we have, from the very start with the planning team, looked to optimise affordable housing outcome from the scheme and looked at different options to try to achieve that. And we think this is the optimum. And we have been through a process with the housing department and our registered providers, housing associations, to make sure that the product that we come up with is the maximum, but also deliverable. We did look at an option whereby we apply the council's preferred tenure split of 70-30. You would get four homes at that point, three rented and one shared ownership. And we're being advised by the housing associations and the council's housing department that nobody would want to manage and take that that quantum. Hence why we've we've moved towards the, the shared ownership option. You like me to pick up on the other two points? Yeah. The I think the reference you were making to the um, to the narrow rooms was a comment from a narrow single aspect. Um, yeah, we we've recently had the chair review with the QRP where we've picked up on some layout changes, so we'll be seeing that. Um, particularly, I think it was this unit here where we've moved this staircase inwards and that's reduced this flat which is a one bed so generally the one beds are the single aspects or some of the one beds um, and all twos and threes are certainly dual aspect the the materials we had again a, a discussion recently on on where we could maybe vary the coloring of the the brickwork front and back and the and, and the balcony uh, colours, but certainly we're aware of number twenty-eight being a yellow sort of stock, and and there isn't so much a consistency across the street. There's a lot of red bricks. Some are brown, or some are red, or some are orange. So we've tried to sort of um, uh, sort of marry that um, disparity, I guess. OK, thank you. So, Councillor Donovan. OK, thank you. Um, from an environmental point of view, I welcome the proposal not to demolish the whole of the existing building. Um, in terms of residential at the front and then commercial at the back, obviously, then you have the space in the middle, which I understand will be partly used as a service yard for the commercial firms, but also there will be pedestrian access possibly to to a to a bike store obviously children may also be using it so in terms of of safety in particular um how do you envisage the safety of everybody um in in that in that in that space in the middle thank you yeah no that's a valid point we've discussed recently this northern corridor this this entrance is for residential pedestrians and and pedestrians to the commercial unit. There's a second residential lobby down here. Um, and the service yard will not be used by any residential pedestrians and uh, subject to the, the use of the commercial building won't be used by pedestrians for the commercial use either. So it will only be for on-site servicing of the commercial unit and then only the removal of bins on bin day by management. So residents do not enter that space. Yeah. Delivery, yeah, deliveries for those commercial space. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
the new development opposite is going to be um, a fair bit above, or at least in parts, uh, above your current proposed heights. Um, did you consider making the development eight stories? We did. <laughs> we had long discussions about it. Uh, it was, we proposed initially an eight story building uh, in part. And uh, I mean, the schemes changed significantly since then, but the QRP and the planning offices were fairly against it. <laughs> okay, thank you. So has, are there any more questions? No, okay, well, um, then I think I just thank you very much for coming and giving the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so we're now on to um, item 11, which is update on major proposals. That's 350 pages 351 to 366. If anyone's got any questions on those, Councillor Bevan? Yeah, on page 360, it talks about Tottenham Howe Underground Station, and it refers to a footbridge. Can you just clarify what that is? Because my understanding is there's a, a footbridge issue outstanding in that whole development and connect up. Is it that footbridge or is it a different footbridge? If, and then the lot, the second one is the lockkeeper's cottage on Perry Lane, which I thought got planning permission years ago and nothing seems to have happened, but it still it seems to be here again. So so what's going on there? Thank you. So yes, um, there was a footbridge to be provided uh, directly from Tottenham Hill Station into Hill Village uh, and a condition to secure that uh, roughly on the alignment of the existing bridge um, that, that takes you from the platform into the underground um, station. Uh, TfL have run into funding issues with that and this proposal is to omit that from the um, development um, and to replace that with uh, public realm works to ferry lane to widen, widen the footpath, the cycle lanes um, and amendments around that to replace the, the sort of accessibility that would have been um, provided by that bridge so that that's under consideration at the moment. And in terms of the lock keepers, um, we had one pre-app um, and we, we haven't um, heard back since then uh, for a revised proposal for that lock keepers cottage site and to increase the height quite substantially there. Okay, hey, Councillor Rice. And there's also originally the resurrection of the London Underground from Tottenham Hale Station to Northam Park Station. We had a long and difficult argument some years ago about this, uh, but it seemed to be back in the fray. Could, could someone perhaps tell us What's happening here? Um, I've not heard any um, proposals for that, uh, so th th there's nothing that has reached planning uh, in that respect. And I can add, if I may, Chair, yeah, I'm not aware anything's in the fray on that either. And given the funding situation that TfL is in at the moment, I can't envisage or see anything like that coming forward in the near future. Thank you, Councillor Emery. Um, Highgate School, we spoke about in, um, I think, about November, and there was talk about um, having uh, further meetings with the public. I'm not sure if you had any more advancement on that. Yes, there has actually just this week, we've heard some confirmation on, on dates and that. So um, I think uh, it's still maybe a month or two away before they'll actually um, have the sort of terms of reference in place to go ahead with that. but we do see, seem to have a clearer programme of, of when things will move forward on that. I'll send you an email on it. Councillor O'Donovan. Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank Councillor Bevan for raising the point related to um, the Tottenham Hale and the um, the condition that was granted uh, that was given before that there should be a bridge um, from from Hale Village over to the to the station. And I understand that there, as it says there's a um an application for to vary that um this this has a, a, a attracted a lot of comments um from the local residents and there was a a, a public meeting 
a few months ago in, in relation to this, not uh, partly to do with, with um, needing that bridge, but also if we don't have the bridge, how is it possible? How is it possible to um, increase access over the road bridge? Uh, because, as you probably know, there's very little space for both pedestrians and cyclists on that bridge. And um, in terms of the process, um, will um, ward councillors, both from South Tottenham and from uh, Tottenham Hale, be involved in this? Will there be further consultations and discussions with um, residents? And is this something that will be decided by this committee or by officers? Thank you. So in terms of the decision, that would be a committee decision um, in, in line with the Constitution. Um, I'm not aware of, of further engagement from TfL, but um, also can't rule it out. We, we've seen the, the objections um, and uh, there's also a petition running, I believe. Um, so uh, I, I, as I understand it, TfL have concluded their engagement, um, but obviously um, th there has been a, a high level of objection. So you know, there may be further engagement, we'll see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we're now on to item 12, which is applications determined under delegated powers, and that's pages 367 to 394. Is, there, is that so? Is that for questions or is that yes? Any any questions? Okay, thank you. So uh, we're on to item 13 which is new items of urgent business and there are none and item 14, the date of the next meeting and that's to be confirmed. OK, so th thank you very much and good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for your contributions. To